Do low carb diets help with weight loss and improving type two diabetes and blood sugar control simply because of reducing calories and weight loss? It's a pretty hot debate. Or is it because they lower glucose, they lower insulin levels by decreasing the carbohydrates coming in and that adds to their benefit beyond caloric restriction and weight loss. This is a debate that's been going on and if you've been following a low carb diet and seeing success, to be honest, you may not care, right? That's one of the interesting parts. If you're hitting all your health markers and you're feeling great, does it really matter why it's working? But for scientists and for, for some clinicians and for trying to design programs to help the maximum number of people, knowing the physiology or the biology behind why a, a specific nutritional intervention works may be beneficial. I'm Dr. Bredstrow, the medical director at dietdoctor.com, and this is a topic that's been really hotly debated, and still there, there isn't one clear answer necessarily, but there was a recent meta-analysis that was sort of talked about publicly on social media, restricting carbohydrates and calories in the treatment of type 2 diabetes, systematic review of the effectiveness of low-carbohydrate interventions with differing energy intakes. So what I find most interesting about this one is that it looked at free living, free eating, eat as much as you want, low carb diet studies versus those that specifically restricted caloric intake, very low calorie intake on low carb diets. The upshot was there was no difference in benefit at 12 and 24 months, whether you had ad libitum feeding, they could eat whatever they want or purposely restricted the calories. Now, here's a caveat. This is a preprint, okay? It was published in MedRxiv, the preprint server for health sciences. So it hasn't gone through peer review and it hasn't been published in a journal. So normally I wouldn't talk a whole lot about preprints because a lot can change as they go through the peer review process. But I think it's such an important topic that I wanted to bring it up. So assuming everything stays the same as this goes through peer review, here's the thing. They said interventions using both restricted and unrestricted energy intakes produced clinically significant weight loss and reduction in hemoglobin A1C at study endpoints. And this is looking only at nutritional interventions that included less than 130 grams of carbohydrates per day. Okay, so still not a keto, not a keto study, but low, low carb could be certainly liberal low carb or moderate low carb or keto. Any of those would fall into this, um, into this category but trials that restricted energy intake were not superior to those that allowed ad libitum low carbohydrate feeding at 12 and 24 months. An association was observed across studies between average weight loss and reduction in hemoglobin A1C, which strengthened with trial length, indicating that sustained weight loss is a key to type two diabetes remission. So let's unpack that a little bit. At 12 and 24 months, it didn't matter really if you were restricting calories or not restricting calories on a low carb diet, they saw similar benefits. And the benefits in blood sugar control seem to track with weight loss. Now, here's what's interesting. Dietary compliance also tracks with weight loss. So we know from these types of free living studies, compliance is an issue. Any dietary intervention, whether it's vegan, whether it's Mediterranean, whether it's vegetarian, whether it's low fat or low carb, dietary compliance is usually pretty poor in randomized trials. Now we've seen in non-randomized trials, we've seen some fantastic dietary compliance, especially with low carb diets and keto diets as shown by the Verta Health trials with you know, compliant in the 70% range at three years, which is pretty remarkable. But I think that's an important thing to note in this study, again, assuming everything holds up in peer review, that was it really the weight loss that led to the hemoglobin A1C benefits, or was it the dietary compliance that led to the hemoglobin A1C benefits and the weight loss? Again, if you're seeing success on a low carb or keto diet, you probably don't care about the answer to this question. But if you're a scientist or a clinician, you might. Now, let's also put this in the context of all these other meta-analyses that we've seen about low carb diets, whether the benefit only lasts six months or whether it lasts longer. And we've done other um, reports and videos about this, but it comes down to compliance and what are people actually eating. And actually Nicola Guess, who is on our medical review board um, at dietdoctor.com, she did a little tutorial about this. If you don't know how much carb protein fiber people are eating or the ratio of unsaturated fatty acids to fatty acids, or whether hypoglycemic medications change or how much weight people lose, you can't control for them and then those are all gonna affect blood sugar control. So if your study doesn't know those things and isn't controlling for them, then what can we really interpret from your study? And she has a meme of someone banging their head against a brick wall. 
And I have to be honest, I love her tutorials. So if all these meta-analyses are showing that when people stick to a diet better, they lose more weight and they improve their health, that's not earth shattering. But here's the thing. If you're a clinician trying to help your patient as much as possible, it's important for you to know what is the diet that they are most likely to stick with. And does that diet have some evidence to support not only sustained weight loss, but blood sugar control and improving metabolic health? And as we've seen from a number of studies and certainly from clinical experience, one of the most important factors in dietary compliance is the issue of hunger and satiety. If you are hungry and have cravings, your chance of sticking to a dietary regimen is far less than if your hunger is managed and your cravings are managed. And the science is pretty clear that higher protein diets are really the best for longer term satiety. Now, is that the case within the low carb context? That hasn't been studied as well as in the general population and in higher carb contexts because lower carb diets themselves also show improved satiety and reduced caloric intake, specifically keto diets, but also low carb diets and especially low carb diets that also increased protein. So when we look at the 30 some odd studies that are randomized controlled trials comparing low carb diets to a control, the majority that show a benefit from weight loss and uh, metabolic health and blood sugar control of those low carb studies also increase either the absolute amount of protein or the protein percentage. So they're both lowering the carbs and raising the protein. And those are the studies that tend to show the most benefit. So it makes sense to me that if you want to find the diet that really impacts your hunger the most and decreases your caloric intake the most in a long-term sustainable fat, lower carb and higher protein. That has the most evidence behind it. And also for more acute satiety, adding in fibrous veggies. Now, fibrous veggies, there's some debate about longer term society because they mainly work by increasing bulk, um, taking up space in the stomach. That's the theory of how these fibrous veggies work the most. So that's going to help you with acute satiety, but then the higher protein and potentially calories from fat can help with the longer term satiety. But here's the other thing, avoiding the triggering foods, right? When you're eating higher protein and lower carb, you're not eating highly refined, processed, combined carbs and fats together, junk food that stimulates your appetite and stimulates your cravings. By getting rid of those, you're getting rid of the biggest offenders. We wrap it up by saying, look, the evidence is pretty clear. Low carb diets work for weight loss and for blood sugar control. Whether they work better than another specific diet for one specific individual is always an unanswerable question until you know that individual, right? These are population-based studies, general studies, comparing two specific diets when really there are hundreds of different dietary variations. So it's important for you to know as an individual or as a clinician that the evidence supports high protein, low carb, high fiber diets as probably the best diet to reduce hunger and decrease caloric intake. Now, whether that works for your patients, you may have to find a specific version of that diet that will work with them. So we try to provide as much information as we can at dietdoctor.com with our personalized meal planners, um, with our recipes and our shopping lists, and of course, with all the information and our guides to help you and as an individual and help you as a clinician guide your patients through this I guess you could say dietary jungle to find the approach that's going to work best for them to help them curb their hunger, curb their cravings, and maintain their dietary compliance long-term, which maintains their weight loss and their metabolic health and blood sugar control. Thanks a lot, everybody. Be sure to click the subscribe and the thumbs up button if you thought this was helpful, and then you'll get more updates here at Diet Doctor News on YouTube.